I'd like to introduce you to Christy Ballman. She's our first speaker. She's my friend. She is an author, psychotherapist, a lover of women. That's true. Yeah. And uh, I am honored. Thank you. Thank you. And I'm going to let you do what you do. I'll do what I do. Ladies, I am 10 months today, in fact, a Brevardian, which I don't think that's what you guys call people who are locals. So that shows how not local I am. I'm 10 months today, I have moved here uh, to Cedar Mountain and Brevard. And let me tell you, it has been, whew, it has been a move. Um, I am 15 years Seattle. Uh, my husband and I and my three kids came here because my husband loves the mountains and grew up in Hendersonville and said, we're going home. <laughs> For me, that wasn't home. I had just had all my children. I had my church, my community, everything I knew um, up in Seattle. And so I stand here today saying that Brevard has surprised me. It has been so kind. And so what I want to say about you all, it means that there's something here in the kindness that I feel taken aback by. I feel hesitant to let myself be mothered, in fact. Interesting enough, we were driving uh, cross country, and so we drove twice during COVID, cross country from here to Seattle with our children. Um, that alone is just, I, don't even give me a PhD. That alone is like God was kind because um, that's a lot of time in the car. That's a lot of time in the car with children and that's a lot of states to drive through. So we're driving through, right? We're leaving the Pacific Northwest and we're talking these mountains. And I got the feeling like they are very masculine mountains, right? They're, they're very sharp and erect and gray. And I've climbed a lot of them. Rainier is one of our big mountains. My husband and I um, climbed before we had children. And I've come to learn a lot on mountains, but I'm not a mountain person. I'm a water person. So marriage and all of this um, invitation to being with mountains is very new to me. It's, uh, it's very much an invitation, and I've learned a lot walking on mountains for hours and hours and hours. I just I want to be in the ocean. Like, give me a warm ocean to dive in 100%, but no. God has decided that part of my maturation is going to be found walking on a mountain. So I've been walking a lot of mountains. So we're driving, leaving Seattle, leaving our home. Um, we had started a church with seven other couples to reach the most human trafficked area of Seattle. So our church literally sat on Aurora Avenue, which means the dawn, light is coming. And we believed that in these dark places of trafficking and sex working, we would see the dawn. Um, so church was very different. I grew up in the South. I grew up, um, I, grew, I mean, my mom got prayed over when I was in her womb. So, I mean, I grew up, I was in utero, I was with Jesus. And I have known Christianity a long time, but I moved and started this church and I thought, I got this. I know what to ask people. You know, we're having a barbecue. We are like helping. Um, and I was undone. You do not ask unhoused people where they live. That is, you don't do that. It became, all the questions became really awkward. You don't ask what you do for work. You don't ask where you live. You, it, 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 all of a sudden, there's a different narrative that you have to learn, or I had to learn. I was used to, right before church, talking to people, hugging, wondering what we brought for potluck. What are we going to eat after church? You know, what you know, ministry are we going to do? And now I'm sitting next to someone who didn't sleep in a house the night before, needed bus money, um, was probably intoxicated, maybe a, a, a woman who had just known harm the night before, who um, we were cleaning uh, needles out of, I mean, our front yard, there was needles and condoms everywhere. This was a new world. This was a new ministry that I did not feel called to either. So I'm starting to notice a pattern here, Jesus. You're calling me to places where I do not feel comfortable. 
So 15 years there, I am, we start this church. We're working um, with m- mostly these women or unhoused neighbors, and I am learning so much. I'm learning so much from people who are desperate. They are desperate and unfiltered. And I thought, and again and again, I would say this even in, on the mission field, I always go thinking I'm bringing something to them. And then I find out that they're actually saving me, that they're actually bringing a gospel to me that I, I had never actually heard from in utero in my life, from, from a kindergarten in a private school. I was in church, you know, um, Wednesday night, Sunday morning, Sunday night, and yet these women are telling me something that is, is stretching my imagination. It's telling me something about God that I, um, I had yet to understand. So, so I fall in love with my church, my community. I'm, I'm there doing this work 15 years. Um, I even had all of my children there. And our, our firstborn son, this is part of my story that will probably come up in the talk, so I'll share it. It's the Sunday before I'm going into labor. I'm 41 weeks pregnant, and our pastor has me and my friend Mel, who's also pregnant, and my friend Cherie, the pastor's wife, all come up, and they pray over us. They pray for healthy deliveries. Um, and and we, are, we are just excited. And, um, and, and that week, my friend Mel uh, loses her little girl, and we are just grieving and the next day I go in to be induced and I find out that my son has stopped breathing. That he had the cord wrapped around him four times and um, that I'm going to deliver a baby who is not alive. And there is much to say that I will, will, will talk about in what I learned in that process. But my friends, my community, my church came around me in such a way, um, you know, the, you, you might all know this, but the people that you birth and you bury with are forever. They stay, they, they, something about that, that holy, sacred, heartbreaking work feels um, just true to note. And so the, our church came around us. We learned the discipline of grief. We learned what it meant to grow something anew after something dies. And I was leaving them. So fast forward 10 years later, I am leaving my community. And I'm driving across country, and I'm looking out of the window. I'm looking at these mountains that I've learned so much on, that I've hiked and weeped on and sang to myself and talked to the Lord on. And I'm like, where am I going, Lord? And we drive across, and we come in to the Appalachian mountains, and I notice that the mountains are older, smoother. It's almost, they're, they're more feminine. They're not so harsh. And, and I, um, it was, I took it in, and I, at first I was like, I don't want this. I want my masculine mountains back. I feel safe with them. I feel safe under men's protection. I don't know what to do with this. And, um, and I was standing there uh, looking. Actually, I was in Black Mountain, and I was looking at the seven sisters. And I had left these, these women in my life. And I felt like the Lord said, I want you to climb those mountains. And I thought, oh, OK. And I looked at them, and they, they looked like my mothers and grandmothers of old had like laid down. And it was their hips and their breast, and they were just so beautifully welcoming me. And I, I felt nervous. I didn't want to. And then I got mad. I said, Lord, who am I going to hike it with? By myself? And there's a, there's a woman here today that I called and said, would you hike it with me? And, um, and we did that in April. And, and what I'll tell you is that I don't love mountains still and I'm surrounded by them. And um, there's something, that's, that's my, my push and pull, even 
even in marriage, I, I have a husband who loves mountains and I am a woman who loves the water. And so then I get to Brevard and Brevard has so many waterfalls. And I'm standing there at the waterfall and I'm thinking, well, this is nice. This is some water. I can't really submerge. I mean, some of them I can. It's pretty dangerous, but okay, I can do this, Lord. I'll submerge in this. And I was, um, I was standing over near a waterfall near my house and the Lord said, Christy, this next decade is you learning about marriage. And it's learning about what it means for the mountain and the water to be together, to be differentiated, but the water holds its own path and the mountain holds its own self. And together they make the waterfall. You've lived in a world where you were in the waters, right? Seattle has these, these beautiful mountain ranges that go up to the Puget Sound or these bodies of water. And that's how I was living. I was living, I was the water, my husband was the mountains, and th we could reside here. And then we moved to Brevard, and I thought, we're only in the mountains. And then it was like, you're not, no, it's not true. There's waterfalls all around you. This is actually an invitation to what it means to be the water with the rock, to hold this beautiful understanding. Now, I do need to talk to Jesus one day about how long it takes the water to change the form of the mountain, because it is a long time. And um, that, that is, a, you know, but other than that, I think, Lord, you are kind. And so as I come in here today, I think that's what I want to say in 10 months that I've learned about Brevard. You are kind and surprising. You are motherly and undoing me. And I feel the invitation to be held. So thank you. I come feeling that. And it's a, a little bit undoing. So I appreciate it. Just in case you need to know some of my credentials, I have done research around women and well-being for the last 22 years. So I have been in school for a very, very long time. And um, I was, you know, nursing babies and taking notes and doing voice memos and um, writing dissertations, and it has been a long journey. But I've worked with a private practice for 15 years. I see women around sexuality and spirituality, and all my research is basically this question. You're gonna get all, you're gonna get all the goods right at the beginning. Don't even worry, you don't even have to go back to school for this, I'm just gonna tell you. Um, I literally ask women and, and have asked hundreds, probably almost a thousand, I think I'm at like 894 women, that I've asked, at the end of your life, what do you believe you will say has informed if you had a good life? What is well-being for women? And in my research, three things have popped up. Number one, community. Community, intention, so that, would, that plays out to, we call it meaning-making. Your life had meaning. You made meaning with your life. Um, so you got um, community, meaning making, and, and psychological awareness. So the more work someone did on themselves, knowing their own story, knowing where they came from, knowing their calling, this woman at the end of her life says, I've lived a good life. I've lived an intentional life. I know who I am. I know what I'm here for. And I have people alongside of me that I look to in the darkest moments and in the most elated moments. And, I, and I, I have accompaniment. So then another thing about Brevard, let me just stop and talk about Brevard. I'm not even getting into my talk. Brevard is becoming a blue zone. You guys, blue zone is amazing. I'm not, I, I can't even just start talking about how great y'all are. But one thing that blue zone says is a lot of these same things is that if you have people, if you're committed to five people in your life for your lifetime, that you, you will see longevity. Intentionality. They say if you go to, um, they're not saying a church, but if you go to something once a week, four times a month, that is intentional around a, a higher being or God, that it also shows that there's meaning to your life, that you would say longevity, that life is good. 
So I'm like, the research is all there. This is great. This is now my town. I can do this. You guys, we're in, this, we're in the same world. Um, but then we get to the church, which is its own world. Um, and so there was a difference when I talked to Christian women, and I started to then spend my time. What does it mean? What does it mean, Christian woman, for you to say at the end of your life, you've lived well? I went to seminary. I, t I um, took a lot of Hebrew, and um, I learned a lot about translation, a lot more than maybe I wanted to even. Um, and and. So I spent time in seminary, and then I got my PhD in psychology. So I am going to bring to you today the lens of psychology and theology and story. That's what my talk is. That's what is made up. Sometimes you're going to be like, that story is out there, Christy. I don't know. Is that scripture? And I'm going to say, no. No, it isn't scripture. Nope. But it is sociology, or it is a story, a myth, a myth or it is something that comes from um, the Torah or the Talmud or you know, I'm, I'm going to give you a lot of content in story, and I'm going to tell you a lot of stories because that's the other thing. Women are storytellers. Women love to set a table. Women love to gather. We're going to talk about the red tent. Women come together, and that's where they create. That's where they regenerate. And it's, it's really beautiful that it's historical. It's been here for a, a very long time. So, um, not to get ahead of myself, uh, oh, I'd love to look at this, this picture. This is my daughter here. Um, and my daughter, I have two boys, and they are the loveliest humans. Uh, and a, I have an incredible husband, and, and this is my daughter, Selah. And Selah has taught me so much about coming back to the femininity. Um, and, coming, and, and her looking at me and saying, Mom, where are the stories in the Bible of the women? Mom, what do women get to do? Who are they in the story? And so uh, thank you, Sayla, for inviting me to this because I'm telling Bible stories at night and my boys are loving it and my daughter's weeping in bed. Where, where are my stories? Well, superficially, um, you know, I know a couple stories, but most involve childbirth, sin, uh, like, the, the story of the female in the Bible is, is one that has to really be dug into. It's not a story that's told. So I'm going to start with the story of the first female. <clears throat> I'm going to tell you the story about Eve. So this idea that women were intentionally created. We could talk about, and I want you to be mindful today when I'm talking about what's going to get in the way from what you already know, what your story has impacted you to only want you to hear, and what do you need to maybe trust God and set aside just to be open to hear um, me today. I'm going to tell you about Eve. So Eve proves to us in the creation that women were created intentionally. You might get caught up, or a lot of people get caught up in this idea of um, made from the rib cage, made from, um, in a sense, where our place is with men. And, th and that's not really, that takes us away. <laughs> Women are great at not learning about themselves. It's the other. We are so good at taking care of the other. And, and we do that um, with men, and we do that with each other. And it's really hard for us to somehow be in our own glory. It's uncomfortable. I would, I would way rather um, be in a, a different space. So I'm going to take Genesis 2. The Lord formed man of the dust of the ground. He breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. Man became a living soul, which he called Adam, meaning earth or soil. God then took Adam's rib from him, which he fashioned into a woman who was called Eve, meaning life or living. So the Hebrew for Eve, Eva, um, meaning mother of life, are full of life. I love it. I love scripture. I love that God again and again is not who I have decided he is. Um, so, so, right, we take this and, and um, we might say, okay, what does that mean? What does that mean about submission? I don't, I don't, that's not even what we're talking about today. It has nothing to do 
with this story. The crazy part of this story is the Talmud would say that the first, that, that um, what was created first for Adam was Lillian. Have you ever heard this story? It's a mythology that Lillian was made out of the dirt and she was not a good partner. And so Yahweh says, no, I will make, some, I will make woman out of bone, out of flesh, out of something living. So again, we can get into that story and we can say, well, well what does that mean? But I would just say to you, what do you do with the fact that we weren't made from dust? That's an interesting tidbit. Now, yeah, do we inherit dust? Yes, because we're made from Adam and from the bone. But we were made from something already living. The female, she comes back to the body. I don't know about you guys, but like my war is with the body. My invitation is with the body. So much of my knowing and my intuition is in my body. And so that makes sense. My husband thinks about providing. He thinks about how, where we're going to live. He loves the dirt. He loves the ground and he hates it. So that's that push-pull. What will I do with the glory of what I come from and the depravity of what I come from? And, and so I see that. I see that wrestling with dust. What I, I mean, we're not talking about men today, but what I love is breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living soul but his name was earth or soil. So that, there is such a story there, but men grow things in the ground. Women grow things in their body. How have we, like, I mean, maybe you guys grew up with this, this being taught to you, but it was just never taught to me. I did not think about it. I did not think, wow, Eve came from a bone. She came from sinew and from something that already had marrow in it. That's, that's kind of wild to me. That is, that, that's really, it's really cool. So um, I think we then have to ask ourselves, if you come from bone, and I'm going to push you a little bit here, what bones have dried out in you? So I feel okay telling this story because Wendy is the only person who hold, heard me tell this story in Knoxville two weeks ago. But I'm going to tell you a story that it, it is, um, again, a conglomerate of scripture and of story. And I'm going to tell you the story of La Loba. Now, I want to tell you with the thought, La Loba is the wolf woman. La Husuera is another way to say it. She's the bone woman. Now, in the Navajo Mountains, somewhere in New Mexico is thought, somewhere where it's desert land and very dry, there's a woman that is kind of fat and hairy. She kind of mumbles to herself. The people in the town do not really know what to do with her. They are so uncomfortable with her. And, and she doesn't actually journey into town. She lives out in these mountains. And she's up in the mountains, and she spends her days kind of scrapping over the ground, and she's looking for bones. And it's told that she's looking for the bones of women that have dried out, and that she, she's the collector of bones. So, you know, this, this story is told um, mostly in a Hispanic culture, but the, the story of, of La Husuera is she comes and she, she gathers these bones, and in her cave, she puts the bones together. And sh she, she puts these dry bones, and she's waiting for one bone, usually. It's the hardest bone to find on the female. It's the tailbone. It sits right back here. And she cannot complete the work until the tailbone is found. So sometimes when she comes into town, all the people look at her kind of weird. She's crazy. She's mumbling to herself. But they all also have a little hope that she's around because they all also have known what it means to feel dry inside, to feel not fully alive. Now remember the name of Eve, Eva, full of life mother of life, 
Okay, so what is Eve's crucible? If she's from bone, dry bone becomes the way evil steals, kills, destroys, marks her. So then you have this story out in the middle of nowhere of this woman who collects dry bones. Now, does anybody know a verse, a story of dry bones? Yes, the valley of dry bones. And how do we know the story to go? That you're standing over this canyon, probably much like New Mexico or Arizona. When I read it in the Bible, I think of this dry canyon. Everything is that brick color of clay. And there's these bones. There's bones of an entire army. What does he tell Elijah? He says, Ezekiel, he, tells, he says, look at these bones and pray that the Holy Spirit comes and brings life back to these bones. You guys, when I think about the kind of faith it takes to look at a valley of dry bones and pray over it enough to see the Holy Spirit bring life back into it, I get a little intimidated. And I think, oh, wow, I understand why La Husera has to be a little bit crazy. She's got to be a little bit crazy. That is not normal. People do not walk into churches and say, I got you guys. I got you. You feeling dry? You're feeling empty? I'm going gonna, I, I gonna to pray the Holy Spirit over you. I'm going to fill those bones back up. I, I'm going to pray that you know a new type of life and and you're, and you're going to go home, and you're going to pour out, and you're going to be full, and you're going to set your tables, and you're going to welcome, and you're going to nourish your children and your friendships. I get nervous about that because um, that's not always been my experience. So, so you got this, so you got this crazy woman, and sometimes I'm like, Lord, are you asking me to be this crazy woman? And I don't, I don't know. But either way, she comes in in the story, and she finally finds the tailbone. She's walking back from the village, how the story goes, and she sees it, and she knows tonight is the night. And she holds it so carefully. This is the bone, and she takes it back. And in the light of the moon, as every probably scary, spooky story would go, in the light of the moon, she puts that tailbone back in. And... In Hispanic culture, it's not uncommon to sing over something. The matriarchal spirit is something that sings over. And so she begins to sing. She begins to sing until the bones start to rattle. And that's where it starts to sound like the Valley of Dry Bones. The Holy Spirit comes down and the bones start to rattle. And then sinew and skin starts to grow on top of those bones life comes back. Life that got lost, that got stolen, that got ripped out. And when I tell you I come from sitting with woman upon woman who's had life ripped out, who's been marked, who's been harmed, who's been lied to or betrayed, and it's something in her spirit said, I'm not going to believe the same way I do did before. I'm not going to hope. Hope is so dangerous. I'm not going to hope the way I did before. No. And their bones begin to dry out. And so what do we do with a God who says, Spirit, breathe, O breath of God. Now breathe, O breath of God. What do we do that we are women who carry bones, and we come from bone. And so do we know the healing work for the female body? Eve teaches us that we come from bone, that we come from something that has life inside of it. <clears throat> and so... <clears throat> Why would you name someone the fullness of life unless you had birthed the potential for them to live to the fullest? What is you living to your fullest? And even if you have 
your body map. Do they have their body maps, Leslie? If you have your body map, you can use this at any time when, 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 you're, when I'm talking. What, if you were just curious for a second, what part of you is getting dry? If you scan that body map, what part of your body has kind of lost feeling, has stopped moving in its fullest self? Uh, to be in the female body is quite an invitation, but it's quite a costly invitation. And so I, my first point of this talk is you come from bone. So what will you do with that? Because now you have to understand what it means to curate and keep your bones healthy and alive. So we're going to talk a little bit about <clears throat> women's roles. So part of this is identity, right? If we come from bone, if we're caretakers of bone, if our most healed self is out of a body, then what is the, what is the story of your body is what we're going to get to. But basically, we're going to start with, with most people, like my daughter who says, who can I be? What can I be? So finish the sentence for me. Before you even read anything up there, women are predominantly what? What comes to your mind? Women are predominantly caretakers. Okay, great. Women are predominantly caretakers. What do we know the statistics of caretakers? Burnout is huge. Okay? So lovely that we are caretakers and costly that we are caretakers. So women know who they are and who they can be. There are multiple types of caretakers. I remember um, getting in psychology. I was thinking about going into medicine, and I thought, well, once you get into, once you get your degree, then you start to specialize. You specialize in the type of work you do. When I got my psychology degree, I didn't specialize until I had hours and hours of it under my belt, and I started to specialize in sexuality and in well-being for women. <clears throat> Janita's going to talk to us today. She specializes in anxiety and depression. We start to specialize in what you do. Well, how do women know what they can be? They look at the person before them. My daughter has an idea of what she can be because she looks at me. We look at women around us, and that's how we know who and what we can be. So <clears throat> I go to the Bible, right? And I say, <clears throat> excuse me. Historically, women of the Bible, judge, queen, mother, midwife, concubine, mistress, priestess, prophetess, present day, I thought this was interesting, 19% of women are landowners, 86% of women are mothers, 68 million married women, so are wives, and 65% of women are human trafficked, 40% of women are midwives or doctors. Okay. Okay. We kind of know what our field is. I would say mother is pretty common, right? Um, midwife, midwife biblically. Women were midwifing all the time. So, so what do we do with these statistics that present day, who we're showing up as women and who women were showing up as in the Bible these are, this is our understanding. So if we're talking about identity, what does that look like? What makes you come alive? Do you come alive setting a table? Do you come alive gathering people? Do you come alive nursing someone back to health? Do you come alive midwifing new life into this world? Do you, do you come alive... Um, I don't want to get to this point just yet because I want to save it. So I'm like holding it on. I'm like, I'm not going to say that one just yet. Keep you guys guessing a little bit. What, what is happening? And so then what do you see of, um, I'm going to read this list. And you tell me. It's different than the list up here. What do you see happening to women when they're living out of their calling? So historically and biblically, the female is referenced as mother, wife, surrogate mother, domestic violence survivor, midwife, wet nurse, princess, whore, concubine, mistress, prophetess, landowners, advocates, priestess, present-day women. 
mother, single parenting. One in four women are single parenting their kids. Women spend 90% of their income on their children. Um, 101 million women have gone missing. Half the sky. This book is the research on the oppression that has come globally against women. Just missing. Gone. It says the oppression of women is the most critical moral and human right issue in the 21st century. Um, some statistics that eight in 10 girls, when they're asked in kindergarten what they want to be, they say president, astronaut, or teacher. When you ask those same, this was a longevity study, when you ask those same girls in third grade what they want to be, they say a model or an actress. What are our, what's happening to our women? What's happening to our girls? What do we know we can be? What do we think we can't be? What are we being called to? What bones are we letting dry that are supposed to stay alive? 35% of women are female doctors. 62% of women now present day own their own land. 15.6 million women have had cosmetic plastic surgery. 100%, well, 99.2 of all women bleed unless a menorrhea, which is the absence of the period, has happened. All women bleed. Women are more likely to say that they're empathetic and they feel empathy in their bodies. What I'm getting at is women, their stories are held in their bodies. That is how we work. We're bodily human. So we come from bone. We look around to know our stories. We're most likely caretakers. We're most likely a wife, a mother, um, a midwife. We're, that's the majority of what we do, a nurse, a doctor. So these are just... Um, some of this idea. I'm only bringing you into the empath of the female so that you can recognize that our bodies are taking up a ton of space. We laugh. We laugh. Yeah, it's true. Our bodies, we spend, a, we spend all our time in our bodies, but our bodies are informing us all the time. The female is always trying to articulate what she feels in her body. The adverse childhood experience, the ACEs test, is the only government-funded test for our children. It says that kids are most successful when they know how to articulate their feelings. So think about it for the female. You are most successful when you know how to articulate what's happening in here to the outside world. That becomes a big goal for women. That becomes a huge part of what we need to be teaching our daughters and knowing ourselves. Our bodies are informing us. Our bones, our spirit-filled bones are informing us. But what do we turn and attack on the most? Who ate two bowls of Fruity Pebbles last night Three bowls of Lucky Charms, which why are those even in my house? <laughs> At my husband was shopping. Lord help me. I was like, babe. And then five cereal bowls later, what am I saying? Oh, Christy, you're nervous. You want to comfort yourself. Right now, you would be with your friends. You're alone in your house in somewhere that's not home yet. You're not hungry. You're homesick. How many times does our body tell us that we are homesick, brokenhearted, lonely, and instead of being with our body, or we are, I was being with my body, I was comforting myself, but there's a very fine line of when you're comforting and when you're harming. 
And so that becomes the work. The work for the female is articulating what she feels in her body to the world, and it becomes how do I comfort myself and empower myself and not harm myself. It's a hard work. It's an important work. And personally for me, I didn't know where to find it. Um, I also put up just this last, being an empath, before I change this um, slide, part of being an empath also is women are more likely than men to, to avoid premarital sex and say that it's essential to faith. Now, that is an interesting statement to me. Oh, I told you, all of my research is on sexuality, and we will get to that. But I, another thing that tells you women feel in their bodies and their, their conviction, their shame, their guilt, it is embodied. It's in them. And so you're going to see that women speak from a place. They know something in their bodies, maybe before they actually even know it some other way. They, they feel it. They, they have a sense. Um, and it's tied to their faith. It's tied to their relationship with God. Um, okay, so I'm going to take the skeletal system. So I'm going to talk to you about bones, and now we're going to talk about how your bones fit in your body. So this says, women's bodies are an essential part of God's creation. Your hair, which crowns your head, the clavicles from which you reign, the mouth from which you lead, the chest from which you care, the pelvic floor from which you hold intuition, and the feet from which you root. Let's just talk about those body parts. Let's just talk about the skeletal system right now. So we, I, I've heard your hair is your glory, the crown, I know that. But these clavicle bones right here, these are what was noticed and noted for queens. How you hold up your posture. If you've ever seen women when they're taught, sit, stand up, stand up straight. Hold your body. Your clavicles are, are right here leading. It's like someone might, my voice instructor used to say, you know, you have a string right here and it's holding you up. This is how you want to hold yourself. We lead from here. Women lead from their clavicles. We reign. That is, if you want a um, physical idea of, of that. I want you to think about that. When you're standing to go speak, when you're um, getting ready to talk to someone, whenever you're just even trying to ground yourself, there's something about noticing your clavicles and noticing how they were made for you to reign from. The mouth. So the female body, right? We have head, mouth, clavicles, chest. Chest, if we go into Song of Solomon, this is the idea that the breasts were there to satiate, whether it was to satiate a lover, whether it was to satiate um, babies. There's something about the chest um, that you, uh, El Shaddai, the god of two mountains, the god of, of both breasts. El, El Shaddai is a god who knows how to comfort, and we comfort from our chest. That's what the female does. The pelvic floor. So the pelvic bones of the floor, the way we hold ourselves, that's where we center ourselves. That's where we walk and our power comes from. But it's also where our intuitive place is, our gut where we feel from. So, so these bones say a lot of how we show up in the world. But note this. If you take these bones and you flip them up like this, the clavicle bones and the pelvic floor bones mirror each other. So there's this here, and then you have your throat and your mouth from which you speak and which you create life through words, through singing, but then the clavicle bones, and then your vaginal canal, and then your vagina is the other, in a sense, hole that you create from. This is particular to the female body. This is not a part of the male body. Men do not lead from the, we don't, men do not create from those spaces exactly like the female does. Yes, do they speak, but what we're talking about right now is the female skeletal system. And so if you look at that, you, ha you have to be mindful of your own body, your own bones. So we take those bones and we want to put flesh to them, right? So I I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move. The bones have stories. If you've broken a bone, that's an important story to note. If, if, if you've um, bruised, but, but that's just our structure. That's our frame, right, that gives us life. But I'm going to keep moving you through this. Now we're going to go, 
Well, let me do this so you, you don't get caught up. I, I, I always read the slides when I'm not supposed to. Um, this, this passageway, this anatomical passageway of creating, right? This place of creating, this place of creating. I don't want you to limit it to um, birth. That, that's not it. And here's what I have spent my life. Whoever knew I would spend so many hours studying the period. I don't even know why. Why, Lord? I just, I don't understand you, but I trust you. So I'm going to talk about why the female body bleeds. What was one of the statistics we know? 92, the high, 99.2. The highest percentage of what all women do is bleed. And bleeding is part of creating. It's an integral part of creation and creating. And the female has to know that in herself because that is our story. That's what we all do. And so when we're bringing ourselves to this world to create, we have to understand the cycle of creation that God intended for us. So we're now putting organs to the skeletal system. We've got the bone that you come from. We've got the skeletal system, which is how you lead and the infrastructure in which you live. And then we start to put the organs in there, right? So let's talk a little bit about how the Bible's come to understand bleeding, right? I, um, I wrote a book, Theology of the Womb. The book starts out, the first thing is that I was talking to, we were at a church camp out, of course, and I'm helping my husband build a tent, which is just not ever good, ever. And we are trying to put up this new tent, and we have our kids running around, and all the people in our church are putting up their tents for this weekend, and it's just a beautiful weekend in the Pacific Northwest. And my pastor's wife, one of my best friends, Cherie, comes up to me, and she is like, hey, um, can you come see for a second? I'm like, sure. So, of course, my husband's a little bit frustrated that I'm, like, leaving. I'm, like, holding these poles, and I'm, like, walking over. I'm like, yeah. She's like, I started my period. Do you have any tampons? And I'm like, I'm still breastfeeding. I'm like, I might have some in the glove compartment. So I'm, like, rummaging in the glove compartment, and I find some. So I bring them over to her, and I, like, hand them to her. She, like, sticks them in her sports bra. She's, like, going to the bathroom. I mean, like, nobody wants to be on their period when they're camping. And, um, and my husband's like, oh, come on, right? He's over there by the tents. He's like, I'm going to tell all the boys that Cherie's on her period. And we just start laughing so loud. And I was like thinking about it later. I was like, why are we whispering? At that time, I was 38. I had had four children. And I'm literally like whispering over here about my period. And I'm like, this just seems strange. I'm a grown woman. I've broken my body open. Like, this is beautiful that I bleed on behalf of creating children and procreating the world. And here is, I'm whispering about it. And that just was breaking my heart. So from this births um, my dissertation research and the book Theology of the Womb, which is just all of how the Bible has actually engaged the period and, or how it hasn't. So you guys, Jewish culture is way ahead of us. They are way ahead of us in understanding. They're not afraid of these things. They don't whisper about them. They talk about them from their teaching. They have teaching that informs women the best way in which their bodies were created to live fully. And I'm like, thank you, Jesus. Um, so I'm going to talk about this idea. So the, so, um, the Bible talks about things in a, a study called homology, where you take bodies of water. So in Mesopotamia regions or um, where the Nile River, you will liken a body of water to a scripture to explain and understand or to a part of the body. So you take a part of the body. And so women's um, uteruses were um, talked about this, the Mesopotamian river was a body of water that when it overflowed from one of the bigger bodies of water, it poured out. And what was said was that it was the God spilling over. That's how it was like talked about in the region. And it was, and that's how the period was talked about is that your, your bleeding is a spilling over. It's the God spilling over. It's your creativeness spilling over, so to speak. And so, you know, I, I'm like, okay, this is great. I, you know, why don't we ever talk about this? Well, it's because it was being talked about in the red tent. 
it's because there are scriptures that you probably know that say when women were on their periods, they were sent out. It was sent out by, alone by themselves. Well, I'm going to tell you this. I don't know if it's true. Scientifically, I cannot find that it's true. But when I was in college and I lived with seven women, we all had our periods at the same time. After we had lived together a while, and I can't tell you why, I don't understand, but it was happening. And it was a present day red tent because in that moment, you're with your people. You don't want to go rollerblading. <laughs> no. You, everybody's waiting to take a bubble bath. Somebody comes home with Epsom salt and you're like, thank you. This is amazing. Right? So it's like there is a sense of, of in the red tent, we were learning something that has not been passed down. And I think this is the work of the church is that we have to establish the red tent because in the red tent, every woman of every age was invited. So womb theology is this understanding of God through the body of the woman, through the body of the uterus. The uterus has three cycles. Psychology uses the uterus. Don't you love that? Lifespan psychology says that we will adolesce. So uh, I'm going to bring these on even though I don't really want to. You can look at these, but it's... It doesn't have to mean anything. We adolesce, we grow up, our uterus starts to practice, we start to shed eggs. We have four million eggs when we're born. When you're in your mother's womb, you had four billion, four billion eggs. That is crazy. By the time you start having your period, you're going to have two billion eggs. The potential to create, do we not have a God that thought women were incredible? Who gives someone four billion things to create with? <laughs> That's insane numbers. Like, oh, Lord, you really wanted your return on creating. Like, you were like, women, here, four billion eggs. You're only in utero. That's fine. I want you to have them with you forever. Great. Okay. Um, so then you, you adolesce. You grow up. You'll start to have axillary hair, pubic hair, and then you start to bleed. And your body in your period is practicing creating. Now, be really careful because um, I don't want you to assume that this means you have to create a baby in your body to be doing the Lord's will. That's not what I'm saying at all. God was way bigger than that. All women bleed as a way of teaching them how to create. And so keep thinking about that idea, right? Keep thinking about this idea that we adolesce, our body practices, and then we have reproductive years, right? So that's like 20 to 38 where we have the potential, the highest potential to reproduce, and then climacteric. We go, we, we senesce. Our uterus starts to go to sleep. So psychology says that lifespan is that uterus lifespan, right? In the red tent, all, all of those women, every woman is actually invited. Once you come to the red tent, which you usually came by being a newborn baby that was breastfeeding, or you came in utero because someone was pregnant and you were birthed in the red tent, and then you stayed 40 days because that's how much time we had for postpartum before a woman was to come back to her family, <clears throat> the female stays in the red tent her whole life. She journeys with her mother. The little girl journeys with her mother and she's there getting her hair braided, sitting with the women, the grandmothers, the mothers, the aunties. And you'd say, well what, well, what about the menopausal women? Are they invited to? Yes, they are actually the most important. They are the keepers of the red tent. They have so much purpose and need because they're the ones picking up the babies from the crying postpartum mothers and saying, honey, it's going to be okay. You're going to be okay. Just lay down. You're going to be okay. I, um, I was in Africa. I was teaching, and um, <laughs> I was with a team of women. And um, my husband was in a neighboring village with his team. And this woman was up there. She was talking. And I see that she's handed her baby because she had come with a, I'm like a one-and-a-half-year-old. And she's handed her baby. And there's this woman in the crowd, this African woman, does not speak a lick of English and she's talking, there's a translator, and, and, and she's up there talking, and her baby starts crying. And she's on stage, and you can see, like, I don't know if, if her milk started to come in, or like, but she, you can tell her body is like struggling. 
And this mother, this older woman, this older African woman, literally pulls out her breast and sticks it in her baby's mouth. Culturally, we all shut down. Everybody was like, okay, okay. Okay, um, I thought the late, I didn't know what she was going to do. I mean, we had kind of been prepped a little bit that we as women didn't fully understand the culture. We, we don't, but I was not ready for this. And so I'm like, okay, you know, AIDS, AIDS are a thing. At, we're, we're, you're thinking all these things are coming into your mind. But after, the, the woman was amazing. She stayed on stage. The baby stopped crying. Um, and we're all sitting there kind of just like, what, what do we do here? So the translator comes up to her after, and the, the woman says, oh, this is what we do for all the young women who are trying to speak and have young babies. It's like, she's like, what's that word? It's like a, a pacifier. And I was like, wow, this is crazy. But she said, how else would they ever speak? And I thought to myself, Oh my gosh. You know, when I go to my mom's house, I just fall into the space. She is like doing everything and she and I trust her. She had four children. She knows what she's doing. She's so capable of things that I'm just learning. And I just thought that woman was telling us it's so important for for us to be for women to be speaking, for women to be at the red tent participating bringing their story, bringing their truth. And the only way to do that is if someone's taking care of your baby. Everyone is needed in the red tent. And we cannot be a church in the Western culture that has forsaken such things. We can't. So I love, I love the red tent. I love that the red tent prepares you for everything. But I'm, I'm going to just... Scoop us back into your female body and the cycle real quick to tell you this. Womb theology is this idea of the cycle, and, and, and you can't, good, I'm glad you can't even read that up there. That's great. Um, <laughs> we wait, we create, we bury. So if we're talking about even um, the phases, oh, I was going to talk about the tr three trimesters of pregnancy, but also if we're just talking about the menstrual phases, let's just stay with the period. We've got, you know, um, your luteal phase, follicular phase. What, what some might say is in your body, hormonally, you're going to feel fall, winter, spring, summer, every week. This is a busy month. It's a busy month to live through all four. But it's true. I feel that in my body. I, and, and I just didn't have words for it. I didn't know how to say uh, what was hormonally happening in my body. And so to understand that, to go into a group where, you know, women are saying, there's a time and a place for each of these things. And if we're fully in our body and we're fully present, we're going to be okay. That's how we need to lead from. We need to be in the stage that our body is in. And we need to be listening to our bodies and what they're telling us. But in our culture, we've become divorced from our bodies. And that is, is not okay. Um, so, I'm going to talk about my last two things really quick. So, as we wait, create, or bury, the understanding that the church, that the, that, that the church is here to midwife the life, death, life cycle. That's what our body does. That's what those phases, that's what is happening in your uterus every month. That's part of our identity. We must wait, we must create, then we must bury again. Now, there could be a kinder word for burying something, um, but part of it that we actually don't want to talk about is women know death. We know life, and, and our creator of life put the life, death, life cycle. He put life twice. He put life, then death is allowed, and then there's life again. There's resurrection there's a, 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 a eternal life. We, li we're surrounded by life, but women at their core know how to facilitate death. We know how to midwife babies into this world, and we actually know how to midwife people into next. We know how to bury the women at the, cr at the cross, the women who prepared Jesus' body. 
They knew the oils. They knew how to wrap it. They knew the work of, mid, of, of midwifing death. And we don't like to talk about that. We don't like to talk about our bleeding, and we don't like to talk about death. And in losing my son in childbirth, what I learned is that this is part of the creating process. And we in the female body, when we say, I'm not going to talk about that death. I'm not going to talk about the cost of bleeding. I'm not going to talk about how I've been marked. I can't look at it. Then we never know how to bury it. We swallow it, and it dries our bones out. And we never know because we don't want to look. And so our bodies take it on, and our bodies start to die, and they start to decay. But the work of the hands of the women is to be in those spaces that no one wants to be in, and find the path to life again at some point, but it does require burying. And we don't like it. It does require bleeding. And I don't like it. And it's the work. And if we come back to our identity as females and as women in the church, the work of the church the work of the women in the Bible, yes, caretaker, caretakers of the body, but how are we as caretakers of our own body? For another time, I will go into my research of sexuality and how we are invited into a very important, powerful invitation in sexuality. But I will say this. In my work, working with sex trafficked and working with women every day who have had some form of sexual trauma or abuse in their story, I would give anything, I would give up any, I would give up sex in a second to save what harm I've seen sexuality do. And so I went and I begged God, show me why. Why do you give us this. And I'll, I'll say it in as brief of a way as I can say it. The life-death cycle is even true in sex because we are creating life through the female pleasure. When a woman is fully alive, she is bringing life into this world. Her joy, her glow, her beauty, what she believes, her hope, she, but it's so closely coupled with death that I can get really confused and say, it's, that is not worth it. There is no reason. There's no reason for the cost that happens for what's been stolen from people. And God said, you know what, Christy? If you bleed every month, if you bury every month, if you, if you know the work, the real work, of resurrection, you would see, you would see the power, the reason I did not send it to harm you. But women are not talking about their bodies and they're not talking about the power in their bodies and we're not talking about what we were created for and so therefore nobody knows what to do. Do you know in Africa, you know what else they do? When it's someone's engagement in the village, so they wear these big necklaces that they get when they get engaged. It's necklaces that they dance and they ululate with. And it's a sound. It's a sound that they make when they weep at a burial. And it's a sound they make in great celebration. And it comes from the throat. Remember what I'm talking about in creating. And so the, the females gather. And again, it's a red tent situation. The women of old, I have never seen anything like this. The women of old come. And what do they do? They teach three sexual positions to the bride because they think it is so important, so important for the longevity of their village. They think it's so important for the female to know goodness and pleasure. And that's what the, that's what the, older, the elders are passing down. You guys, that blows me away. I don't talk to my mama about sex. It, 
And yet, who then will I talk to? I barely talk to my mom about bleeding. Who am I going to talk to? I'm going to keep it inside. I'm going to wonder alone, laying in my bed, bleeding by myself, cramping. Like, what? There's something wrong here. The silence feels wrong. We were made to create. We have to study the process of creation. That's our bodies were made to create. So I'm going to have you look at, at the image again, the body that you have. Um, and I'm going to talk about story. The female body has a story. No one else in this room holds the story your body holds. So we've gone from bone, we've gone from the skeletal, the organs, the hormones, and now I'm going to talk about your actual story, the psychological, the part of what has it been like? What's your birthright? What's your birth story? How did you come into this world? Birthright is a huge thing that women have fought through historically in Bible times. Birthright is usually given to the male and usually the first male. The daughters of um, Zeofolda, Zepafolda, Zepafolda. I'm trying to remember. I don't have my notes in front of me. Five daughters. Their father is the high priest and when he dies... The daughters go to Moses and they beg to inherit their father's land. And they weren't allowed to. This is the first time in the law that women said, do not give us to our uncle. We've been raised in the ways of the Lord. We know how to do this. I say that to say, you have a story. You have a body. What have you inherited So then integration of that story. Our stories hold our identity and our calling in them. And so stories need to be remembered, integrated, and told. How do you tell your story? Well, let me tell you, you walked here in the room, and your body's telling the story, even if you choose to or don't. How do you hold yourself? Who in your story has touched you in a kind way? Who in your story has harmed you? Who in your story has, ha, has marked you? Do you know those stories? Do you know how you came into the earth? Do you know how you came, how you were birthed? What was your mother's pregnancy like with you? What was her postpartum? What happened to your family system after you were born? What did God say about you on the day you came into this earth? What did evil say? Because they both said something. And probably thematically, if you look at your storyline, it is reenacting that war between good and evil in you stepping into who you truly are and who you were made to be. It's happening probably all the time. What's your story? Know your story. Know how to articulate it. Know what's happened. Know why you chose friends, the type of friends you chose. Know what your mother struggles with that's been passed down. Know what your father said, good or bad about you. Know those stories. Know who you tend to put yourself with. Who did you marry? Why did you marry that person? What are your children exposing in you? We need to know our stories. We need to know our stories about how we bleed, we need to know how we bury. We need to know how we bring forth life. And I'm not talking about just in the physical birthing of a child. I'm saying that part of the inheritance of the female from a God who made her from flesh and bone, that the Holy Spirit flows through. Part of her story and her identity is to know how to speak, how to gather how to hold a baby, how to lay a baby down. What's the work before you? What were you called to do? What does your body not want to know? 
and why. There is no one that holds the story that your body holds. And we, the red tent, need you to speak. We want to be with you. We need your stories so that we are not alone living out of our bodies, trying to at least. Leslie's going to come up and we're going to do a Q&A time. And I just want to talk about Leslie for a second. This woman has such a passion for you all. I got, she came to a weekend I did with some women um, here a month or so ago. And one thing I know about her is, is her deep conviction to, to women living free. And so would you, if you want, ask the questions you want, knowing that both of our desires um, for this time today is for you to ask those questions that you might need to ask, to maybe pick up that tailbone that's dried out, to maybe ask for someone to pray or sing over you, Whatever it is, don't be afraid. We need you. We need all of you. And I feel like that is God saying that. We, I think when God breathed life into the female, there was a sense of where he said, I need you to show up and show this work, the same work I'm doing. Co-create with me in this life. And, and it is hard work to create because you will have to bleed. You will have to bury. And that's part of the work. But I promise you life is coming. You are an ever bearer of life. Thanks. Thank you, okay, we have no questions. <laughs> we have what? I have no questions. Oh, yet. great. So text away, ladies, if there's something. <gasps> wow. Good. If I answered all the questions, that's great. Oh, I have a question. Oh, great. What happened to Lily? <laughs> that's a great question. You know, I uh, don't know. <laughs> I don't know if, I don't know if, I, I mean, the hard part with just scripture enough, it's, uh, I haven't done enough research in the Talmud to like follow that line. Um, you could get into some crazy mythical, yeah, um, the Asher pole and, and the, uh, that gets a really intense when it comes to the idea of um, taking the female down is the kind of the like underlying of it. And so, yeah, I, um, I need to get a good answer for that. I need to do some more research, but supposedly she is part of um, what it means to know the underworld and like the dream state of the female and she, she knows the ground. Um, but I don't really know. I mean, I just, I, I, I stuck with Eve. <laughs> I stuck with Eve. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Nothing. I'll, um, you know what? I, um, I'll finish. Oh, yeah. There's one. Oh, this is a good one, too. How do I figure out my story? Hmm. Yeah, so um, that's a great question. Um, I, it's so interesting. I actually have a book coming out um, the, uh, probably early next year that is the five sessions of story for the female. So it's the, f the five places in which are rites of passage. So we all have rites of passage in our life. So knowing your story is understanding your birthright. That would be the first. And then probably the, and, and so when I say this, I say you could go home and do your own therapy in the sense that you can go home and write a story. And it's really intention and taking time. And we say, don't, don't tell a story from 30,000 feet. Tell a story Tell me the color of the blade of grass. Tell me what it looks like. Tell me the curtains in the room. And so, you know, you could take a story under 900 words 
and write the story of the, the day you were born, your birth story. And you might say, I don't, I don't know my birth story. We have enough clues, right? We have the idea of were your parents together? Were you um, the f- a first child? Were you, you know, where are you in the storyline? What was your mother, what was her postpartum like? What was her birth like? I ask a lot of questions. Were you C- C-section, vaginal birth? Were you breastfed? Were you not? I mean, we ask those questions to get details of story because we can infer from all of that information. What's the story like with your relationship with your mother? Um, what does she fear? What does she free you in? You, there is, there is so, um, there's so much in our relationships. What's the story with your father? Um, what is his story with the church? What's his story uh, with females? What's his story in his marriage? We can collect understanding of our story. But I would say birth story, we really do, if you're really quiet and intentional with your birth story, you can find out a lot um, about what was, what happened. Like the clues tell us, was it hard for you to get here? Was it not? Um, yeah, uh, when I came into the world, I was a really hard birth. And my mother says, when I came out, she's, my grandmother had said, the hardest ones are usually the biggest blessings on earth, right? Um, my mom named me her daughter of joy. That has been a suffocating relationship my entire life because I need to be something for my mother. And we have had to wrestle that. Now, I love my mom. I love being under her care, but she needs something from me that I had to name because I was feeling it all the time. And it wasn't my job. It was her work that she let me inherit. That's how you would start to explore your story. You then might tell the story the first time you bled, your period, what that was like. You will tell the story of um, the first interaction you had uh, sexually. You tell the story of um, what marriage has been like. Our stories are right there, you guys. That's the crazy part. But until we either go to therapy or we pay someone to tell us to tell that story, we, we don't really focus on ourselves. That's the other thing about the female. She, she's not innately inclined to focus on herself. And so that, that can bring up a lot. We don't know what to do with our glory. It will cause jealousy. It will cause disruption. Um, it, will, it will cause a lot of, a, a lot of havoc and um, in our relationships. And so we, we kind of hide our stories and we keep it inside. But I think telling your story, writing your story is, is the first way. And, and it honestly is about sitting down and just writing what you know. And you know more than you think you know. The body does keep score. The body does know. The same skin that I have right now was the skin that came when I was birthed in the birthing room. And so though I may not remember because my brain wasn't fully formed, my body remembers. Great. Okay, great. Can trauma to the body manifest itself later as chronic pain? Well, um, peer-reviewed research now would say yes. Uh, it's still hit or miss with the science that you're going to contend with. So if you're talking to a uh, maybe more Western medical doctor, you're going to have pushback. But have I seen it a lot? Yes. I've seen it to, to the T, cro- someone coming in with chronic pain and, and um, it being tied to trauma that has been held in the body. Is that what it is all the time? No, I'm not going to say that. But I will say that as... A psychologist sitting with people, yes, I have seen trauma and chronic illness 100% tied in certain people's stories. Here's another question. Um, Where do you see a woman that has had a hysterectomy fit into the dynamic? Mm, I love that. I actually have written a lot about um, hysterectomies. I've done a lot of um, marking ceremonies for women who have had hysterectomies. The, the woman who has a hysterectomy has known death in, in a way that few know. And she can lead in understanding that 
in a way of loss. That, uh, that, and here's the thing, the, women, the woman's body knows loss. So it's just a level of, again, maybe we would even uh, categorize that as trauma, but something being taken out of your body. So I would liken this to even if you've had a mastectomy, that the scar tissue holds memory. And so I would even say having um, an organ removed, having something removed from your body is still going to leave scar tissue in some level and scar tissue then still holds story. So whether or not it's in your body is, is not the, the point. You still have hormones, you still know loss, you still know, you still have scar tissue. There, it doesn't change except for the particularity of what you know. You know loss in a way that women who have not had a hysterectomy do not know. And so loss begets loss, meaning like we can sit with people who know loss. We can do surgery, so to speak, on someone's heart and mind because we have known places with a particularity and a specialty. And I would say that is of the woman with a hysterectomy. She knows something that few know and that makes her a specialist in a sense in that work. Yeah. We have a lot of questions and we may not get to them all. Um, we can come back. To so them. we'll figure, yeah, come back. We have two other follow-up times that we meet and I will hang on to these questions. Um, how can we, hang on, how can we encourage and empower women to talk about sex and pleasure without shame and embarrassment and time-wise this will probably be the last, but I'll hang on to your questions yes. for the next follow-up. Um, sex is such a sensitive subject, and it's because it's such a powerful gift. But it has stolen so much. And because of that, it can trigger something in your body. So right now, I say the word sex, and something triggers in your body that is different than every other person in this room. Because you have a story with your sexuality and it is so intimate that if you don't know that story, we're, you're gonna shut down, right? There's, whether it's secondary trauma, whatever's gonna happen to your body, we will shut down, we will shut our bodies down. Um, I mean, that's even part of the female arousal cycle. She doesn't get aroused unless she's safe or unless she's overridden that to a place of being aroused by harm, which is not good. But what I'm saying is that we are sensitive human beings. And so to talk about this with other people is going to be a sensitive subject. And you're going to have to know that immediately someone is going into their own story that you don't know, that you don't understand. Someone is carrying a body that you have no idea what it's like that they have carried, what it's like for their breast what it's like for their vagina, what it's like. So these body maps that you have is the first place of awareness, right? I have clients write down names, words, so people who have impacted their bodies. I have them scan the body map and they can write words down there. They can write their scars. They can map out where they have scars on their body. They can map out emotional and visible scars. So I just tell you that to say the first step of talking about it in um, a a more holistic and, and communal way is for us to know our stories so that we can know uh, this is how I was harmed by this action. This is how I have freedom in this. This is, you know, this is why, um, you know, they, you would, it's interesting what they say also in Africa is that they share what they know. The Western woman hides herself. So, so she says, I have something you don't have. I've figured out how to keep my husband happy. I'm not gonna share that with you, but I'm sure as heck gonna know that I have it, I'm gonna let you know that I have it. We are not, Western sexuality amongst women is jealousy impacted and informed. We do not freely give away for sexual health in other women. We don't know that, we weren't taught that. There's a, there is a sense of, of pride or even piety of like, I am more holy because I can keep myself covered and you can't. We can judge. We, there's, there's so much, there's, it's so loaded that we have to first know our own stories before it's ever going to be safe enough to talk about it amongst each other. Thank you. 
Ja. 